definitely worthy of our praise this morning. So I welcome you here, and I encourage you to shout out a praise and sing your praises to Jehovah God. Thank you. Okay, well with that, please stand, and let's join our hearts together and welcome the Lord into this place. Give a cheerful welcome to those around you this morning. Hey, so, 
Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you out in the house of God this morning. I do not have a slide for this, but I was told some eggs have made their way into the building, and not the expensive kind either. The chocolate, coconut, and peanut butter ones. Mm. The youth have a box of eggs out in the foyer. If you would like to help support them, they will gladly exchange your money for eggs. Kids, this afternoon, after the morning service, is your practice. Tonight at 6 o'clock is prayer, praise, and seek. Church is open. Uh, Sunday mornings also from 7 to 8.30. Wednesday night is our... Yeah, I forgot about it already. Not Ashamed series and children's ministry. Next Sunday, we have a special speaker and Matthew Volbrecht who will be joining us. Um, don't forget March is... Um, Toothbrush month for our shoe box. <coughs> our, our slides seem to be going a little crazy. <laughs> but as you're watching them, we will go through them. Home groups are on the 25th, don't forget that. Uh, anybody that needs directions to the diver's home, make sure that you see Jeff. He will get you there one way or another. I just won't tell you which way. <laughs> The youth dinner to go is Friday the 31st. There's going to be more details. Hopefully the menu will be coming shortly. Uh, ladies, on the 29th of March, there's going to be a ladies banquet at Haas's. There's a sign-up sheet out in the foyer. Uh, make sure you sign up for that. And the books are here as well. The books have arrived for the women's Bible study. The first night of the Bible study is April 1st at Megan's house. And five or six, five o'clock, okay. Five o'clock that evening, uh, we'll be at Megan's. For all other announcements, make sure you check out the website, the bulletin, and the calendar. So if the ushers will come, we will receive your morning pies and offering. <coughs> will you join me in prayer this morning? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for another wonderful day that you've given us. Lord, another day that we can come into your house, free from persecution, Lord, and just lay it all here at the altar and give it to you. Lord, we thank you for all that came today. We just ask that you bless those that are here as well as those that could not make it, Lord. Lord, just remind them how much we love them, even though we don't get to see them here today. Lord, just prepare our hearts for this service. Lord, we know that you've laid some wonderful worship music on the worship team's heart. Lord, may we just take it all in as we prepare ourselves, Lord, for the word that you've given the pastor. Be with us this week. Keep us safe in all that we do. And Lord, bring us back again when the doors are open. We thank you, we praise you, we give you all the glory and all the honor. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand. I hope you're looking forward to being in his presence and being a blessing to him this morning.
Praise, Praise the name of the Lord. Praise what a marvelous name. Praise the name of Jesus. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise the Lord. There's no other name. The name of Jesus. There's no one else we can worship today. We worship Jesus alone. Hallelujah. You're our Savior, our healer, our baptizer. Jesus, without you, there is no hope. There is no peace. There is no joy. There is no contentment. There is no satisfaction to the genuine satisfaction that you bring to our lives is lost without you. We depend on the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Will you lift a hand? Will you worship him this morning? Thank you, Jesus, for being Lord of our life. Thank you for being number one in our lives. Thank you for being our light and our life. Thank you for being the purpose we have for serving you is that we, Lord, might know you and that we might know the power of God working and operating in our lives. Hallelujah. We worship you from the bottom of our hearts today. We give you praise. We give you honor. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. You're so worthy of our praise. You're so worthy, Lord, of all that we can do for you. But Lord, we can't even begin to count what you've done for us. Lord, you've given us hope. You've given us a purpose to live. Lord, you've given us all that we need in order to bless those around us, to minister to those, not just in our families, but in our communities, literally around the world, to touch people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes. Lord, we depend upon you. You've never left us. Never. You will never forsake us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're faithful. And Lord, we give you praise today. We give you thanks from the, again, from the bottom of our hearts. We thank you for being Lord, Savior, and Master of our lives. For this, we give you praise by the life we live. And we pray this in Jesus' wonderful and holy name. And everyone said together, Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hey, give somebody a a hug, will you? Give them a smile. Just tell them you're glad to see them in God's house. Praise the Lord. It's good to see you in God's house today. Praise the Lord. Thank you for being here. I could probably think of another hundred places you could probably be, but you chose to be here today. Amen. You chose to honor God and to fellowship with God's people and to enjoy his presence with one another. Thank you for making that choice today to say, I'm going to be in God's house. Praise the Lord. If you're visiting with us, we're, we want to welcome you. Thank you for being here. We're honored that you're here with us, and we're thankful that the Sharon Bible Institute, right? The gang's with us today. It's great to see you guys here today. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. We're so blessed. Your school's been a real blessing. It really has. We, we are thankful for a school like yours in our area. It's been a real a real blessing to us. Thank you for being a part of us here today. And anyone that's visiting today, make sure you fill out your visitor's card. 
we have a very special gift for you today. Someone will see you when the service is over and make sure that you receive that. Praise God. Praise God. We're going to let the kids go. Have a great time, guys. I know they're participating and practicing. They're starting a, um, their kids are going to do a special presentation for us on Easter. All right? They're preparing for that. So we're going to have a breakfast here at 930 on Easter Sunday morning. And at 10 o'clock, the kids are going to perform and then a worship service after that at 1030. So please make that a part of your schedule on Easter, Easter Sunday. Praise God. Well, open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 14. I don't have a PowerPoint again. Can you believe that's three weeks in a row that I <laughs> I have not had a PowerPoint? I'm breaking tradition. This is terrible, isn't it? No, not actually it's not because I, I really felt, again, uh, in the middle of the week, I just felt like I need to change it. And I had to take the... I had to take the message out of the bulletin and put a new one in, all right, uh, without Janet even knowing it. <laughs> so I really feel like it's time for me to speak this message that I know I've talked to you several times about. I've asked you to repeat this. I'm always a part of the answer to every prayer that I pray. You've heard me say that before. Now we're going to do a sermon on it. I really feel like God wants us to speak share this this morning there may be somebody here that really needs to hear this and needs to understand that god has a powerful word for them today so i want to uh share with you exodus chapter 14 verses 1 through 16. we're probably going to read probably uh verses 3 uh the middle of verse 3 down to verse 16. you've been standing a while so i won't ask you to stand um but uh, follow along in God's word. I'm going to be reading from the NIV. All right, in chapter 3, or in chapter 14, verse 3, the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion. They're hemmed in by the desert. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all of his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. And when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, what have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So he had his chariot made ready, took his army with them, he took 600 of the best chariots along with all of the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. And the Egyptians, all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped at the sea near Pi Harith, I think that's how you pronounce it, opposite of Baal Zephon. And as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. And they said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Did we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. So Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. And the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. And then the Lord said to Moses, and here is the clock. This is super important. The Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. 
Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. Father, the word of God is always faithful and true. So we stand before you today by the power and the anointing of your Holy Spirit that, Lord, we would not only hear your word, but we would heed the truth to your word today. Thank you, Lord, for imparting your wisdom and your direction in all of our lives. And we pray that when we leave here, we will truly know that you sent us here for a divine purpose and a plan for our life for this week and the days ahead. Lord, be praised and be honored through this message today. And we pray it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said again, Amen. 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 The title of my message is today, An Answer to My Praying. Simply an answer to my praying. I hope there will be a number of you today that will listen to and hear this message from the Lord concerning a big or large prayer request that you have in your heart. I'm believing for the moment of truth for you individually, as well as for us as a church, the body of Christ. I believe God wants to speak to all of us individually and corporately today, and he wants us to understand that the power and the anointing of his Holy Spirit rest on his word and what he wants to declare to you today. Amen. God has a miracle for you. Yes. But to get us started, we need to explain just briefly this passage of Scripture. As most of you know, that there is the Israelites are coming out of Egypt's bondage land. They're in captivity for all these hundreds of years. And now, finally, Moses is called to release them out of Egypt. And they're in a panic mode. They're in a what I call a wits and corner. There is no place to go. They are literally hemmed in. The Pharaoh's army is behind them, pursuing them. There are mountain ranges on either side of them. And for them to get into the promised land, they must cross the Red Sea. So the sea is in front of them, literally hemmed in, no place to go. And the strangest thing begins to happen. In verses 15 and 16, God tells Moses, literally, this is a literal translation, and stop praying, Moses. I want you to stop praying. Now, that's a strange request. We don't tell people to stop praying in a stressful situation. If anything, we tell them, pray all the harder. Pray more often. Pray with other people. Do whatever it takes, right? We'll do whatever it takes. Keep on praying, but God says to Moses, stop praying. Stop praying. When it comes to understanding prayer, we have to realize that God has already done everything he's going to do. I want you to hear me carefully today. He is going to do in every situation, he's already accomplished a design plan for your prayers that are, I believe, being answered. What more does God need to do? He has already done it all. He created us. He died on the cross. He rose the third day. And yes, he resurrected, given us forgiveness for our sins. He's given us hope and eternal life. He has provided the power of the Holy Spirit to comfort us and to lead us and to walk by him side by side. God has already done everything for us he needs, we need to know as God's children that he has met every need he is going to meet for you. Amen. It's already done. It's accomplished. It's in his word. So what is it that we need to do? If God has really done it all, what is it that we need to do? I want you to repeat these words after me. Please do it and do it nice and loud. Do it corporately. Please repeat these words. I'm a part of the answer to every prayer that I pray. Go ahead. I'm a part of the answer to every prayer that I pray. 
In this message, I want you to understand that there are three things that are all we're responsible for in receiving the answer to our prayers. Listen to me carefully. I say it again. God is saying to us again, please hear the heart of God. God's done everything he can possibly do to already answer our prayers, to meet our needs, and he's designed our life in a perfect way so that we can see the blessings and the goodness and the power and the miracle of God in all of our lives. Amen. I'm here to tell you that this morning. Believe that with all of your heart. God has done everything he can do. He's done it all. But in this message, I want you to understand these three things for receiving the answer to your praying. And they are, we're responsible. Number one, obedience is our part of receiving the answer to our prayers. Simply obedience is our part to receiving the answer to our prayers. God will not do for us what we can do for ourselves. It does not, he does not expect us to do what we can't do. You see, God's already done it. He's done it all, but he's not expecting us to do something we can't do. He leaves that for himself. Think of all the miracles in the word of God. There is always some little part that mankind has been responsible for. Let me just jog your memory. Let me give you some really quick examples where Jesus instructed others to do something in order for their prayers to be answered. He said, take up your bed and walk. The lame man began to walk, who had not walked in his life. God, show your, go show yourself to the priest. He told him, go show yourself to the priest. Dip in the pool of Shalom. Stretch out your hand. Share your lunch with the multitudes. Every time God would heal somebody, he gave them an instruction. He gave them something that they needed to do to be a part of the answer to their prayers. There's always that part of obedience. If God says to you, take up your bed. No, I'm not going to take up my bed. My mom's taken up my bed. My dad's taken up his bed. My sister's taken up his bed. My goodness, my friends have taken up the bed. But God, I'm not going to take up my bed. Could you imagine the man, the lame man, not taking up his mat and really be willing to walk? He had never done it before. But God said, I want you to obey me. Take up your mat. Take up your bed and walk. Begin to do it in faith. When Jesus says to do it, the authority commands us to do it. Say it with me again. I'm a part of the answer to every prayer that I pray. I'm a part of the answer to every prayer that I pray. So let me give you some biblical understanding of obedience. What I'm talking about is we have to be obedient in the routine of things of life. <laughs> the routine things we have peter he's a great example the enemy backs him into a corner you remember the story he backs him into a corner and asks of his master jesus had paid his temple tax and peter says well yes so jesus sent peter out now they didn't just begin to pray about it and storm heaven and pray and ask god to help them to get the coin that they needed to pay their taxes some people would just say, if Jesus wanted to pay the taxes, just open up your pocket and let Jesus drop it in there. He'll just drop it in there because he's Jesus and he'll just do whatever you ask him to do. Go get a, but Jesus said, no, I want you, Peter, to go get a line, go get a hook, and I want you to go catch a fish. And in that fish's mouth will be a coin and you go and pay our taxes. Notice Peter's occupation was a fisherman. Jesus used his occupation in order for Peter to obey. He could have said, Jesus, I've fished there for 25 years. I've never caught a fish yet with a coin in it. Jesus, don't you understand? This is a ridiculous thing to do. I've never caught a fish with a coin in its mouth before. That, that what makes you believe that that's going to happen this time. But again, Peter had to be obedient. 
And sometimes we like to tell God how it should work or how it should not work. Peter may have said to Mrs. Pete, you know what Jesus told me to do? He told me to go out and catch a fish. And Mrs. Pete probably said something like this. And I could hear my wife saying this. You know, Pete, if, if Jesus told you to do it, you better do it. If you want to be blessed, you better do what Jesus tells you to do. Right? That would be her advice. So that's what I'm thinking. But it's our job to do the routine. It's God's job to put the coin in the mouth of the fish. We obey. He performs a miracle. Somebody say amen. Amen. We obey. He performs the miracle. Praise God. But there's a second thing to this obedience. We have to have an obedience that is absolutely complete. Let me give you an Old Testament story where you see the story of Naaman, the general, who had leprosy. And the maid said these words, Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet who was in Samaria. I wish you were with the prophet Elisha. So no, Naaman drove his chariots to Elisha's house and he sent a lieutenant in with him and Elisha was told by God that Naaman was to dip in the Jordan River seven times. Now this river's dirty, it's muddy, it's yucky, it's terrible. You know, it's like when I used to live down along the river, it was always muddy, it was always yucky. I never, oh, I never got in that much, believe me. Why don't you let me just use another river? Let me go somewhere else. But why would you put me in the, this Jordan River? If he really expects a miracle, he has to be a part of his answer to his prayers. So it seemed like a silly thing to do. Why would, why would I want to go in and dip in this old River Jordan seven times? But the humble servant said, look, if God would have asked you to do a great thing, some great big thing, you would have done it. But this might seem silly, this might seem ridiculous, but if the fact is, you don't know what God has in store here. So we want to see the great manifestations. So we love to see the power of God at work. We want to see the spectacular. Why can't the prophet just pray over me? Why can't we just go there, get healed, get this thing over with? But that's not what happened. In this account, Naaman obeys, and he takes the first dip in the Jordan River. He gets up, nothing's happened. Boy, could you imagine if you had to do that? God says, I want you to obey me completely. I want you to dip. You dip once, you get back up. And the enemy's speaking and whispering in your ear. See, it doesn't work. This is stupid. This is silly. This is ridiculous. Why would God have you do this? He dips the second time. The same thing happens the third time, the fourth time, the fifth time. Oh, this is ridiculous. What am I doing here? This doesn't make any sense. God, why do I keep persisting? And you're not healing me. And finally, the seventh time, the complete seventh time, he dips down in the water. He gets back up and the leprosy is completely gone. Praise God. He's healed. You know the story. God's instructions are complete. And we need to obey every part of his instruction. Why seven times? Because seven is the number of completion. God expects complete obedience because he wants to do a complete work in all of our lives. Say it with me again. I'm a part of the answer to every prayer that I pray. I'm a part of the answer to every prayer that I pray. So the answer to every prayer is in the asking. Every prayer has an answer. I'm going to tell you, every prayer that you pray has an answer. And the reason we feel we may not have the answer is because we may lack the sensitivity to the Holy Spirit being obedient to him. Maybe there's something I'm withholding from God. Maybe God's trying to speak to me. The Spirit's trying to tell me there's something I need to do, and he wants to perform the miracle, but he wants me to have complete obedience to him. Obedience is the first. The second is listening 
is always a part of receiving the answer to our prayers. How do you listen? Well, that's for really another message, but this is extremely important for us to understand and listening to God on a daily basis as we're communing with God in prayer. When we need to hear what God's saying, we have to meditate and we have to seek and we have to listen. Now, listening, number one, I think means caring about what God thinks. Sometimes people are like the man with his prayer list, you know, and he's tired and he's wore out and he wants to go to bed. And instead of taking his prayer list and praying before he goes to bed, which we traditionally would do, he says, Lord, I'm tired tonight. The list is on my dresser. You can read it just as good as I can. Good night. <laughs> Praise God. God will understand, right? Sometimes we just don't want to take the time to pay attention to our prayer needs or the prayer needs of others. And we are more concerned with what we want to tell God, what we want to hear from God. And there are times when we are not interested in what God wants to tell us or what he thinks about our prayer request. God, let me take some time. Let me hear what is it that you want to say about this prayer need. And sometimes we pray like God doesn't know anything about it. We pray a novel. Oh, Lord, oh, oh, Lord. And there's nothing wrong with it. And there's, there's places in Scripture where we can take you and where we could understand that we need to pray in specifics, that we need to be willing to pray out and what God wants us to understand. But the Bible says, don't you know that your Heavenly Father knows your needs? He already knows. And if you're tired and you're weary and you're worn out and you really don't have it together, God still knows your need and you don't get it all out. You don't get it just right. God still clearly understands what you're feeling and what you're going through. But it's the seeking and the knocking. In Matthew's gospel, we're told we're to seek and to knock and the door will be open, right? Seek, knock, and then ask. But you got it. here's what you have to understand. Seeking and knocking is more important than the asking. You see, the reason we're to ask, to seek, and to knock when we're praying is so that we can hear what God wants to say to us. That's why we seek after him. That's why we knock on the door. And the door, <coughs> door opens when we spend the time seeking God and his word, what he wants to say. So that when the knocking comes, we knock and God opens the door when he wants to, when he needs to, when it's the best time for you, when it's the best time to answer that given prayer or those given needs. Knocking is required so that the timing of God, because we've sought, we are seeking the Lord, we're asking the Lord, and we knock and the door is open. But see, listening means taking time to communicate properly. If I'm driving down the road and suddenly I get stranded and I get on my cell phone and I call Mick, I'm gonna call you brother. I'm at the beach. What did you say? I'm at the beach. Oh, he's at the beach. <laughs> You would ruin my illustration. <laughs> Mick's at the beach. I'm stranded. And I call Mick up and say, man, you're a wonderful guy. You have a lot of wisdom. You're so important to me. I'm stranded. I'm stranded. Could you help me? I give him no instructions. I tell him, no, and I hang up. Thank you for being such a great friend. I know you'll be here, right? He has no idea where I am. He has no idea about how he's going to help me or what my needs really are, right? He just, I just hang up on him. You know, sometimes we do that with God. God's ready. He says, yes, I'm ready to help you. And we say goodbye before he gets a chance to even help us. Do you remember back in the day when we had walkie-talkies? Come on. I just saw a Leave it to Beaver episode with walkie-talkies on it. <laughs> Wally gets on the old talk, walkie-talkie, he, he has to press a button in order to talk through it so that Eddie Haskell could hear him on the other end. Then he has to release it so that Eddie Haskell and his smart mouth can come back to him and he can hear it, right? And so now we got over, now you tell people over because you only hear one side at a time. 
You know, so you have to release it in order to hear the other person. It was an awful thing. We thought it was great. We had walkie-talkies growing up, my twin brother and I. We'd go about a mile apart. We would talk to each other. It was great. We had a lot of fun with it. But now, my goodness, you can talk both ways. God set up a conversation where it's not like a walkie-talkie. You know, he can listen while we're talking. We can talk while he's listening, right? Isn't it great to have an open line communication to God? God says, stop praying. And then he tells Moses, start to listen. Now, can you imagine you're at wit's end corner? You got mountains on either side of you, the Pharaoh's behind you, the sea's in front of you, and God says to you as the leader, stop praying, shut your mouth, be quiet, listen. That's basically what's happening. I'm a part of the answer to every prayer that I pray. Listen. If God tells you to stop, listen. You're a part of the answer to every prayer that you pray. Now here's the third part, and the final part. Taking action is our part of receiving the answer to our prayers. There is a risk involved in receiving answers to prayers. Look at verses 15 through 17. And notice that God's telling Moses to do. He's telling him to go forward, speak to the children of Israel, declare your position, and go forward. Okay, so, okay, guys, here we go. All you millions of people, follow me. Here's where we're at. We're at, the, we're, at the, we're at the sea. We have nowhere to go. And this is going to take a lot of faith on Moses' part because he's got to stretch out his rod as if it's some kind of a magic wand. Okay, I want you to take your rod and I want you to stretch it out like it's some kind of a, are you crazy? Why would we do something like this? You can't get to this point in your faith without being willing to obey and listen. Moses had to be willing to obey and then listen before he could get to the point where he's going to do something so ridiculous as to stretch out his staff. And so you can't take the action that seems so unnatural without having some kind of faith. This is an unnatural thing. And at this point in Moses' experience with God, he must have learned to a great deal about who God was and what God wanted to do because his staff, remember at one time, turned into a snake. God says, I want you to pick it up. And that serpent, I want you to pick it up and it'll turn into your staff. That took some courage, at least for me it would. I don't know about you, but I hate snakes, and if they're black, they're gonna die. I don't care what kind of snake they are. And I killed one this last summer, didn't it? Wasn't it this summer I killed one out on the porch? And boy, did I kill him. I chopped him in two pieces, three pieces, I'm sorry. And I didn't pick him up after he was dead, I shoveled him up. Took him down there and threw him in the yard so the lawnmower could could run over. <laughs> that was my plan. <clears throat> and Jim got him. <laughs> right. But see, I'm convinced we don't see answers to our prayers at times because we have to be obediently listening to God. For miracles to take place in our lives, we have to understand that prayer is not about me getting what I'm asking for. See, sometimes we pray so we can try to get and receive what we're asking for. When God all along already knows what you need, he's going to give you what you need whether you think it or not. Whether you think that's what you need or not. And so God is in such a way that he's already aware that he's already done. Listen, Moses knew this. He's aware that God's already done everything he's going to do. So I'm going to listen to him and I'm going to lift that staff and I'm going to believe for the miracle to happen. Amen. I only need to learn to be obedient, listen, so I can take the proper action for God to do what he's already promised to do. Notice Moses used what God had already given him. Did you notice that? 
God has already given him that. Maybe God's given you a talent. Maybe he's given you a spiritual gift. Don't just pray and forget what God's given you to use. Moses was a shepherd. He used his staff. God has ways to use you to be a part of the miracle. Do you know that creation was the only time God did it all on his own? God has something for you to use to glorify him. He can divide the sea for you. He has something in your home. He has something in your life. He has something he wants to use, some gift, something that he's given you to use. I believe we are withheld from miracles because we don't want to pick up the snakes. We have to be a part of the problem. It's a risk. It's an act of faith. When we're involved in obedience, the thing that we touch turns to gold. When we're obedient, when we listen, when we're willing to do what God has asked to do, it will turn into gold. Prayer dies in churches. It dies in people's lives because they don't realize that prayer involved Calvary over 2,000 years ago. Provisions for your prayers have already been made. Amen. They're already taken care of. God's already going to do what he's going to do, what he's promised to do. We just simply need to be willing to obey. Listen. Listen. Always remember, my hand has leprosy. But as long as I keep it my hand, I cannot be healed of my leprosy. As long as I do God's will, that hand can turn to gold. Take your stick and stretch it before the sea. Just like Moses, your step of action will part those waters and literally destroy the enemy. And finally, there is an authority that's involved with the answers to your prayer. God told Moses, I give you authority. You shall take up serpents. We have the authority over serpents. Amen. It's our ministry to take up the evils of this world. I'm not asking you to go out and do evangelize and knock on doors and talk to everybody about the Lord. I'm not asking you necessarily. Now, you might feel led to do that. Then do that. But I'm not asking you to go out there and touch doors and, and go into everybody's house and, and touch the evil, but to begin to pray and ask God to help you to become a part of the answer to your prayers by being involved in other people's lives, being involved in the evil that's out there, being involved in some way, helping people. Our hands are full of leprosy, and only as long as I do God's will can I keep them clean, and whatever the problem is before you, the ministry before you, you must have a stick that is stretching. God says you have something to contribute. Stretch it. Use it for the glory of God. Amen. You see, your life and our church will be stopped until we become a part of the answer to our prayers. We won't accomplish much. The scripture makes it clear that God's giving us the authority in the name of Jesus. In fact, Matthew's gospel, chapter 16, verses 17, 18, says, and these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongue, and they will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will be no means by no means will it hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. It's a promise. We believe in the miracles. We believe in answers to prayer. Then we're told in John 15, 6, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and I have ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit 
and that your fruit should remain, that wherever you shall ask of the Father, he may in my name give it to you. Amen. He wants to give it to you. He wants the miracles to happen in your life. God has already designed for those miracles to take place. God has already made the provisions. He's done everything he possibly could do. He's already made it for us. All we have to do is simply submit to him. Amen. See, that's where the problem comes in. Suppose someone were to offer me a thousand dollars for every person I shared the gospel with. Every person, I get a thousand bucks. You're going to give me a thousand dollars to talk to somebody about Jesus? Man, I'd be glad to do that. I can make a lot of money. <laughs> People hang up on you. This week I got a phone call where a guy was desperate. He said, I need somebody, I need somebody to talk to him. I, I really want to take my life. He was really upset, very, very upset. And I said, oh, okay, I had to repeat himself because I wasn't sure what I, was, what I was really hearing here. So I began to share the gospel. I began to share Christ with him. Guess what? He hung up on me. Yeah. Like Tom said earlier, he probably wanted money, wanted something. I don't know. But the fact is, I wasn't going to... I wasn't if he's really hurting, he needs Jesus. We need to talk about the Lord. You know, I, I, I had to start somewhere, right? And so that tells me he really didn't want to hear it. He wasn't ready to get really get the help that he really needed. But let's say I get a thousand dollars for speaking, people hang up on me, it doesn't matter. I get a thousand dollars for everybody that I speak to. Now, when I speak to more people because I'm getting a thousand dollars. Or would I speak to people because it doesn't matter about the money? Whoa, wait a minute. Is my love of money stronger than my love for God and souls? What motivates me? See, we want God to answer our prayers, but sometimes we're unwilling to completely submit ourselves to the plans in answering those prayers. Somehow we want to we, we want to add to it, or we, we think we got to do something different, and we're not willing to listen to what God said. Please repeat after me. I'm a part of the answer to every prayer that I pray. If we're wondering why God's not moving, like we like to see him move, maybe because we're not taking the active role of really being a part of the answer to our praying. I have to ask myself that all the time. Am, am I listening to you, God? Am I really obedient? Is there something you're trying to say to me? Is there something you're trying to do in me and through me? Is there something I need to do in order for me to be in line with you? God performs the miracles when we get the fish and the bait and the hook. And then he'll put the coin in the mouth. He'll perform the miracle. And when it's all over, we're going to sing the victory song like Miriam did on the other side of the Red Sea. When Pharaoh's army was completely swallowed up. And the sea came back and swallowed them up completely. And then there was the song of Miriam. The shouting the praise to God. Remember, it's in our obedience, it's in our listening, it's in our taking action that our praying will assure us the victory we need to overcome anything that happens in our lives. Anything that happens. That's just the simple truth. That's a simple message today. Is God, all he's asking us to do is be attentive to what he is saying to us. And don't expect God just to answer every whim that we have, every desire that we have, just because we go to church and we read our Bible and we pray a little bit and we try to do the right things and we try to live a right life. God is asking us, listen, what is he saying in his word? What is, what's the action he wants you to take? Because we are designed to take up serpents. We are designed to see the seas part. We are designed by God 
to see the miracles happen in our life. But all we have to do is simply, right? Listen, be obedient, take action. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for the simple truth of just leading and guiding our thoughts, <coughs> reminding us today if we truly want to see God transforming power in our lives and in our church. Lord, we must be a part of the answer to every prayer that we pray. God, I thank you that you have performed miracles that we don't even deserve. Lord, you have done more exceedingly abundantly, exceedingly abundantly, far more than we could ever think or ask or imagine. You have accomplished in our life more than we deserve. But Lord, we don't want to just stop at the little mundane things that we see in life. We want to see the miracle working power of Christ manifested in our lives individually. And we want to see the healing power of Jesus Christ demonstrated. We want to see salvations. We want to see all those things that you have promised us in your word, that you have made provisions for. But Lord, help us to be sensitive to your spirit that we might see that we're a part of the answer to every prayer that we pray. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand please? Praise God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Sing with all your heart. Desiring God to give you all our being. Lord, we're believing that this week 
we will be used by you. That we will see the power and the might of God in our lives in operation. Not because we've just prayed, but because we've been obedient, that we've been willing to listen, and we've been willing to take action. And that, Lord, our prayers will be answered as we submit our total being to you. Thank you for every provision that you've already made. All we need to do is obey and trust and put our faith and our confidence in you. Thank you for the lives that will be changed and transformed because of our praying and our willingness to submit to you. And God, thank you for the changes that will take place in our own lives because of what we've been willing to submit to you. May you be glorified and praised and honored. And we give all the glory and all the praise to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. God bless you. Have an awesome, awesome day.